All right. Going to do a quick recap so we can dive right in today. King Acrisius of Argos finds out that his daughter, if she has a son, the son will take over his kingdom and kill him. So, when he finds out the daughter is pregnant by Zeus, he takes the daughter, he takes the baby, puts him in a box, shoves him out to sea. The box, with the little help of the Olympians, arrives safely on the shores of the island of Seraphos, where the fisherman, Dictus, rescues him and takes him and gives him shelter. Unfortunately, that fisherman has a king for a brother, Polydictes, and Polydictes has decided that he wants Danae, the mother, to be his new queen. She does not want to be queen. And so he manipulates things to get the son, Perseus, out of the way. And in a moment of youthful brashness, Perseus promises Polydictes he will bring him back anything he wants as a gift. And the thing that Polydictes wants is the head of Medusa, the Gorgon. And this is a problem. The first major problem being that just to look at Medusa will turn a man to stone. But this is the promise that Perseus had made. So this is what he is stuck with trying to accomplish. But as he soon finds out, that isn't necessarily even the hardest part. It might be the worst part but not the hardest part of this trial, this test, this quest of his. Turns out the hardest part, finding the Gorgons to begin with. He travels. He sails from the island of Seraphos, and he wanders far and, ro- far and wide with traders and fishermen, and he walks and he hikes and he hitches rides where he can, but nowhere can he find where the Gorgons live. And it turns out that nobody knows where the Gorgons live. And Perseus realizes he might not fail at this quest because he dies at the hands of Medusa. He might fail at this quest just because he never even finds her. And so Perseus is standing at a crossroads. He's upset. He's worried. He's angry, of all things. And that's when he hears the... Excuse me, brother. And Perseus goes, wait, I don't have any bro... And he looks over his shoulder, and he sees a handsome young man and a beautiful young woman. And the handsome young man is reminding him of something, but he can't quite place it until he sees the wand that the young man is holding in his hand. A wand with two ribbons wrapped around it. Oh my goodness. And then he looks at the young woman, who is wearing a full set of armor and a high-crested helmet and a shield and a spear. And he goes, oh... You, you are, and you, oh, and he bows low. Because, yeah, he doesn't have any brothers on his mother's side, from Danae. But on his father's side, he definitely has siblings. And the two siblings that have come across him just now are the gods, Hermes and Athena. Zeus had heard of Perseus' quest. And he wanted Perseus to succeed. He saw great things in Perseus' future. And he saw great things in the future of Perseus' children and grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. But first, Perseus had to succeed with his mission. Now, there were kind of rules on what the gods could or couldn't interfere with. They couldn't just go and bring back Medusa's head for Perseus. But there are some little things that they could do to help that would make a big difference. For one thing, Hermes lent Perseus his sword. 
and his sword was so hard and so sharp-edged, it could cut through just about anything, including the metal scales of Medusa's neck. Nice. Athena lent Perseus her shield, and her bronze shield had been polished so clear and so bright that it was like a mirror. If she told him that if she if he looked through Medusa only through the reflection in the shield, not directly at the Gorgon herself, he would survive. All right, so these were the two things that he needed to know, or needed to have. But there was one thing that he needed to know, and that was where the Nymphs of the North were. Because the Nymphs of the North had more gifts that would be necessary for his mission. And they also had the location of the island of the Gorgons. And so Percy says, great, tell me where the Nymphs of the North are. And Hermes and Athena looked at each other and said, nah, we don't actually know. But we do know somebody who does. The Greye, the Grey Sisters, they know where the Nymphs of the North are. If you can convince them to tell you where the Nymphs of the North are, the Nymphs of the North will tell you where the Gorgons are. And Percy said, oh, easy, excellent. And, but Hermes and Athena were looking at each other again. And he's like, oh, what is it? Well, the Greye are actually cousins of the Gorgons. And so they aren't going to want to tell you where the Gorgons are. But, hey... He'll figure something out. Let's go. And at that, Hermes grabbed Perseus under his arms and flew off with him as fast as he could. And as far as he could, he flew far, far, far west until visible on the horizon was a tiny little speck of an island that got closer and closer and closer. And it was the most dismal, most depressing, grayest chunk of rock in the middle of the sea that you could ever imagine. And Hermes deposited Perseus on shore. And Perseus walked inland and he found the Grey Sisters, the three Grey Sisters. And they were called the Grey Sisters for a reason. Their skin was gray. Their hair was gray. Their clothes were gray. And between the three of them, they shared one graying tooth. And one gray eyeball that they passed back and forth. And they would pass the tooth back and forth to take turns chewing their food. And they'd pass the eye back and forth to take turns seeing. And when Perseus showed up, the first gray sister shouted an alarm. And the other sisters wanted to see what she was seeing, and so she tried to pass the eyeball to them. And Perseus lunged forward and snatched the eye and leaped back out of their reach. And he said, tell me where the nymphs of the north are. And they said, never. There's only one reason why you'd want to know where the nymphs are. And we will not put our cousins, the Gorgons, in danger. And Perseus said, fine. I'll just crush your eyeball underneath my foot. And that did the trick. Life was hard enough stuck out on this gray island with just one tooth eating whatever nasty scrub stuff washed up on shore. They didn't want to become blind, too, on top of that. So, they told him and Hermes how to find the nymphs of the north. And so Perseus tossed the eyeball back to them. And Hermes picked him up again and flew as far, far, far north as he could so far north that they even passed the home of the North Wind until they finally came to the home of the Nymphs of the North. And these Nymphs, unlike the Grey Sisters, welcomed Perseus's visit, welcomed him into their home, and offered him food, and offered Hermes welcome as well. And when they learned what Perseus's mission was, they knew exactly what to give him. He had a weapon, Hermes' sword. He had armor, Athena's shield. But the other things he was going to need were winged sandals. 
They had a pair of winged sandals that would allow him to fly, so Hermes didn't have to carry him everywhere, because Hermes would not be allowed to carry him into the final mission. That's the first thing. The second thing they gave him was a cap, but it wasn't just any cap. It was actually Hades' cap. In their possession, in their keeping, was the cap of Hades, god of the underworld. And if you can remember to way, 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 way back to the first stories, that cap had been made for him by the Cyclopes. And that hat allowed him to become invisible. So he had shoes that would let him fly, and he had a cap that would let him become invisible. And then they gave him a bag, a magic bag that would hold safe whatever was put into it. So now, he's got weapons. He's got transportation, he's got disguise, he's got luggage, Whew, he flies off again. And so he flies back down south, and then he flies west, and he flies even further west than he had when he'd gone to the island of the Grey. And he finally comes to the island of the Gorgons. And as he's soaring in above it, he sees that the whole island is littered with bizarre sculptures which he soon realizes are not sculptures at all. They are not statues. They are the bodies of every person that has found their way to the island before him. And that is his number one sign that he is in the right place, finally. And as he sneaks a peek at the island, he sees the three Gorgons are all sleeping. And Perseus decides, hmm, I'm a hero, but the odds here are not good. Three against one. So, stealthily, stealthily landing on the shore, stealthily creeping forward, using only the reflection in the shield to guide him. He approaches the three Gorgons, and as he approaches the youngest of them, the one in the center, Medusa, he lashes out with his sword, slices her head off in one blow. Hermes' sword cuts clean through the metal scales guarding her neck, right through her spine, head lops off. And then Perseus, still using the shield to see, grabs the head, picks it up, tosses it in the bag, and seals it shut, and turns his back on the Gorgons. Now, he's home free. All he has to do is take off and fly out of there, and he's just being very, very... But there is one little problem, one little thing that happens. And that little thing that happens is, well, out of the bleeding stump of Medusa's neck, a creature appears. Out of this giant gaping wound in the neck of this dying monster appears a beautiful, magical creature named Pegasus. The bright white winged horse from Greek myth. And Pegasus pops out of Medusa's bleeding neck stump and flies off into the sky, free. And it neighs loudly as it goes. And it's the neighing part that's bad for Perseus, because this wakes up Medusa's two sisters. And those two sisters, when they see their dead sister between them, they fly into a rage and they fly after Perseus. And Perseus beats feet. He takes off. He flies off using those winged sandals. And he flies as fast as he can. And he's starting to pull slightly ahead. But he's really worried. Because those Gorgons, their wings are heavy and made of metal. But they're still wings. And that's when he pulls out his magical cap. Slips it over his head. And he becomes invisible. And the two Gorgon sisters lose track of him in the wide open sky. And they weep and they wail for the loss of their sister. And they return home to take care of her dead body. Perseus now is home free. He's ready to go home. And so he's flying back east, trying to get back home. And that's when, as he's flying past the coast of Ethiopia, he sees what he thinks is another statue on the shore. 
but it turns out it's not a statue. It is a woman, a young woman, chained tightly to the rocks. And that woman's name, he will soon find out, is Andromeda. Now Perseus flies down to land next to her and says, Who are you and why are you chained to these rocks? And Andromeda tells him that she is the daughter of King Cepheus and Queen Cassiopeia. And she is the punishment from the gods. And Perseus said, no, you're not punishment. You're a princess and a pretty one of that. And he lashes out with Hermes' sword and cuts through the metal chains, binding her to the rocks. And Andromeda says, thank you for rescuing me. But no. And Perseus says, what do you mean, but no? Chains cut, you're free. Heck, I can carry you out of here. These winged sandals, they can carry a lot of weight. And she says, no. If I do not die here today, my kingdom will pay for it. And she tells Perseus the whole story in kind of a fast way because it turns out she's on a deadline. See, Queen Cassiopeia was beautiful. Perseus had an easy time believing it because her daughter was quite beautiful as well. But Queen Cassiopeia, not only was she beautiful, she was beautiful and she knew it. But not only was she beautiful, and not only did she know it, she apparently wasn't that smart. Because she bragged about her own beauty. And if you know anything about Greek myth, anytime you start bragging about yourself, bad things are going to start coming. And the thing that locked it in for sure is Cassiopeia didn't just brag that she was beautiful. She bragged that she was even more beautiful than the Nereids of the sea. And remember, the Nereids were nymphs that lived in the sea, lived in the salty waters, and they were part of the realm of Poseidon. And when they heard that this mortal woman had dared to compare her own beauty to theirs, and not only had she compared her beauty to theirs, she said that she was better than them? Uh-uh. Not done. And so... Queen Cassiopeia had to be done. And Poseidon stepped up. And he sent a punishment. And he sent a punishment in the form of a sea monster. Now, if you are very, very old school, like me, because I am, in fact, older than dirt, what you might expect to hear right now is somebody saying this. Release the Kraken. Or, if you're not quite as old school, but still a geek, you might expect to hear someone say something like this. Release the Kraken! Or, just to drive the point home, you might be thinking of someone who says this. The Kraken! But here's the thing. This is the story that all those movies are referencing when somebody says, Release the Kraken! But the Kraken actually isn't in Greek myth. The Kraken is actually part of folklore from Norway, way, way further north than the Greek archipelago. Why they chose the Kraken in Clash of the Titans? I don't know, but they did. But in fact, the word that shows up in the original Greek myth in this moment isn't kraken, which again, not a Greek word. It is cetus. And it's a little confusing whether cetus is the name of the thing, as in, I named the cetus, or if it's the name of a type of thing. Because Perseus isn't the only hero to fight Cetus. Heracles, who happens to be one of Perseus's descendants, also fights a monster called Cetus. But back to the story. While Andromeda is telling a story to Perseus, the waves begin to churn and roil, and they see this massive, horrifying monster swimming through the water towards them. 
This is the monster that Poseidon had let loose on the kingdom of King Cepheus and Queen Cassiopeia. It had been ravaging the coast, destroying villages. And the only thing that would appease this monster that would stop its rampage would be the death of Andromeda. Because that is the way the gods worked. Oh, you have offended me. Now, either all your people die or your daughter dies. Choose. Well, eventually, the king and the queen had chosen, and rather than let all their people die, because without them, they would be king and queen of anything, they would let their daughter die. And so, the monster is coming, and Perseus wastes no time. He takes to the air, soars up high above the monster, and then dives down, blade forward, and he slices into Cetus. He slices into the monster as he flies by it cutting it deeply. And then he flies up, and he dives down again and again and again, and he slices the monster and just cuts it until it finally rolls over and sinks, dying beneath the waves. And so much blood came out of this monster that it actually tinted the waters red for years to come. And from that point on, that particular body of water was called the Red Sea. So, Perseus has rescued the princess. He's happy. She's happy. Somebody who's not happy is the guy that she was supposed to marry. See, she was engaged. She was betrothed, as many princesses are. And when the monster showed up, her fiancé, instead of rescuing her, like Perseus did, had run and hid with his friends. Well, now that the monster is dead, all of a sudden he's got all kind of bravery. So he shows up. And he demands that Perseus hand Andromeda over. And Perseus looks at the beautiful girl. And she looks at him. And she's looking between the two. The guy who ditched me for dead. The guy who just saved me. And she nods at Perseus. And Perseus looks at the suitor and says, Nah, you and your droogs, you and your boys, you can go away now. And when it looks like they want to fight, Perseus decides to fast forward things. Rather than try to outfight a dozen men, which is going to be tricky, even for him and even with a magical sword, he opens up the bag and pulls out the head of Medusa. And when the suitor and his friends see the head, see that face, they immediately turn to stone on the spot and are dead. One slight problem there's a bit of friendly fire. Because the suitor wasn't the only one who showed up at that moment. King Cepheus and Queen Cassiopeia had been rushing to greet their daughter as well. And they caught a glimpse of the Medusa's face. And they turned to stone as well. And so they are dead. But because... Their daughter was now betrothed to Perseus because he asked for her hand in marriage. She said yes. And because they figured the price had been paid, the gods took King Cepheus and Queen Cassiopeia and put them up in the stars as constellations. As a bit of a constellation prize for, you know, killing off their kingdom and getting turned into stone. And so Perseus leaves Andromeda where she's at for a bit. He says, I have a little bit of business to take care of back home, but I'll be back for you. Just give me a few days. I got to fly out of here, take your business, and I'll be back. And the princess, now queen, Andromeda says, I've got problems to take care of here. Someone's got to put this place in order. I'll be waiting for you. And so Perseus takes off flying. And I'm actually just going to say right now, in case you're thinking this is another Theseus situation, nope, Perseus does come back, does get her, they are married. So, there's a happy ending there in the middle of all the carnage. But Perseus flies back to Seraphos. And when he gets to the island, the first thing he does is land at the hut where his mother and Dictus, the fishermen, live. But they are gone. They are not there. And Perseus finds out from the neighbors that they are in fact in hiding because King Polydictes had decided 
that he had waited long enough and he was going to force Danny to marry him. Well, Perseus decided that was enough of that, and so he flew straight to the palace of King Polydictes, and he storms into the throne room where King Polydictes is surrounded by all his henchmen, and he says, King Polydictes, you wanted your gift. I have brought it. And he pulls Medusa's head out of the bag. And King Polydictes and all of his best friends turn to stone. Quest done. Perseus is free and clear. The fishermen, Dictus and Danae, come out of hiding. And the entire island decide that they want Dictus to be the king now instead of Polydictes. And he takes over as king. And he is a good king. And the people of Seraphos are happy to have him. And now that he's no longer a fisherman and he feels he's worthy of it, he humbly requests Danny's hand in marriage. And she, after years of friendship, says yes. She knows he's a good man. He has taken care of her through no be- to no benefit of his own. And her son, all these years, Yes, she accepts his proposal, and they are king and queen of Seraphos. Now, at this point, Athena shows up, because it is time to return the gifts that have been lent to him. Perseus happily returns the gifts that were lent to him, with zero regrets. And in fact, he adds one thing. He realizes Medusa's head is far too dangerous of an object to have around. Even though it has saved him a couple times now, if it falls into the hands of the wrong person, bad things. But even in his hands, well, his mother-in-law and father-in-law were statues now, so... And he takes the head and he gives it to Athena. And Athena enchants the head and mounts it on the front of her shield, which is now back in her possession. And from that day forward, whenever she would ride into battle, She would uncover her shield, and Medusa's horrible head would roar a terrifying roar of anger as she rode into battle, striking fear into her enemies. Although, to be honest, if I saw Athena coming at me, I'd be plenty scared already, wouldn't need the whole Gorgon thing, but that's just me. So Perseus, he returns to Ethiopia. He picks up his wife Andromeda, and they sail for Argos, because... He now feels it is time for him to return. It is time for him to return to his grandfather, Acretius. And he just knows that now that he's a hero, now that he's accomplished, he has killed the Gorgon. He has uh, killed a sea monster. He has rescued his mother from an evil king. Certainly, Acretius will be proud of him and welcome him. And both he and Danny can come home to Argos. But King Acretius hears Perseus is coming. And he remembers what the oracle said. And the key part of those accomplishments of Perseus that he focuses in on is the kills the evil king. Acretius dips. He leaves. He runs away. So by the time Perseus and Andromeda arrive in Argos, there's no king. And when he shows up, looking all heroic, descendant of the king who's just disappeared, and he has a queen on his arm, they figure, yeah, I guess you're the king now. So he and Andromeda take over Argos, and they rule over Argos well. Just like Dick, Dis, and Danae were ruling over Seraphos well. And Perseus was an amazing athlete. And so he would travel all around Greece attending the various games, such as the Olympic Games. And he would compete, and he'd win all over the place. He's quite proud of his athletic ability but apparently didn't brag about it because the gods didn't punish him. But as a demigod, he was fast, he was tough, he was strong, he was skilled. And he had one event in particular that he took great pride in. Discus. Now, for those of you who don't know, discus is a sport in which you take a disc made of wood and metal, kind of like a really heavy, dangerous frisbee, and you chuck that sucker as far as you could. In high school, I threw the discus as a sport. Except I couldn't throw it very far. I just was not good. I was no Perseus. Anyway, one day, 
Perseus is competing, and he hurls the discus so high and so far that the wind actually starts to catch it, and a horrible gust of wind catches it and blows it off course, and the discus, hurled with such force by Perseus, now boosted by the wind, flies into the crowd and strikes an old man in the head, killing him instantly. Anyone want to take a guess what the name of that old man hiding in the crowd was? And so the oracle had come true. Perseus had taken, Perseus had taken over Acretius' kingdom, and he had killed Acretius. One of the things to know in Greek myth, the oracles always come true. No matter what you do to change it, all you do is make it happen. And thus basically ends the story of Perseus. Um, after the death of his grandfather, he becomes really quite sad, and he decides that he no longer wants to be king of Argos. He hands over his kingship, and he travels, and he founds a new city, the city of Mycenae. And he becomes like the father and grandfather and great-great-grandfather of other heroes. He, like a whole house of heroes, like a dynasty of heroes, including one of the greatest Greek heroes of all, probably the greatest Greek hero, the hero Heracles. That said, Heracles coming up soon. I might do a couple small tweener episodes between there and then because, here and then because, school year starting, I'm swamped. Want to keep up, but whoo doggy. I need a break. I'll throw in a couple small uh, episodes in between. A couple side notes, though. If you've seen the Disney movie Hercules, Hercules is the Roman name for the Greek hero Heracles. And if you go and watch Disney's Hercules, after I've told the story of Perseus, you will actually recognize a lot of things from the story of Perseus in that movie of Hercules, including Pegasus. In the Disney movie, Heracles, or Hercules, rides Pegasus. In the original myth, he didn't. He comes across the three fates, and the fates are definite figures in Greek myth. Um, I'll talk about them in a mini-episode. But uh, in the Disney movie, they combine the three fates with the Greae, the three Grey sisters, and turn them into one trio of sisters. And there's a couple other things here and there that you'll recognize as well. So, tell you what. Check out the Disney movie, see what things you can recognize from the story of Perseus, and then after that, I'll be telling the story of Heracles, and you can see what you can recognize from that. But in the meantime, have a good day, go find some good stories. Thank you.